ಶ್ರೀಗುರುಭ್ಯೋನ್ನಮ ಹರಿ ಓ ಶ್ರೀಗಣೇಶಾ ನಮಃ ಓಂ ಗಂ ಗಣಪತ ನಮಃ ತತ್ಪುರುಷಾಯ ವಿಮಹೆ ವಕ್ರತುಂಡಾ ಧೀಮಹಿ ದನ್ನೋ ಧಂದಿ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀಗಣೇಶಾಯ ನಮಃ ಗುರುರ್ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಗುರುರ್ವಿಷ್ಣು ಗುರುರ್ದೇವೋ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರ ಗುರುರ್ ಸಾಕ್ಷಾತ್ ಪರಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಗುರವೇ ಸರ್ವೋಕಾನ ಬಿಸಜೇ ಭವರೋಗಿನ ನಿಧೇ ಸರ್ವಿಧ್ಯಾನ ಶ್ರೀ ದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ಥೇ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ಶ್ರೀ ಸೈಸ್ವರರ್ಪಣಮಸ್ತು ಯೋಗೇನ ಚಿತ್ತ ಪದೇನ ವಾಚ ಮಲ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರೋತ್ ಪ್ರವಾರ ಮುನೀನ ಪಥಾಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲಿಣಕೋಸ್ಮಿ ಆಹು ಪುರುಷಾಕರ ಶಂಗಚಕ್ರಸಿಧಾರಿಣ ಸಹಸ್ರಶೀರ್ಷ ಶ್ವೇತ್ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಪಥಾಂಜಲಿ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ಶ್ರೀ ಯೋಗೀಶ್ವರಾಯ ನಮಸ್ತು ಓಂ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ವೀಕ್ ಟು ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ಜರ್ನಿ ಇನ್ ಟು ದ ಯೋಗ ಸೂತ್ರ right last week i began by talking to you or telling you about the background to patanjali and his work on the yoga sutras basically i told you there are four books in the entire you know almanac called the yoga sutras right samadhi pada sadhana pada what are the other two okay you can think about that right so today we are going to start with the samadhi pada which has 51 verses i'm looking at 14 verses today and then continue on until we finish samadhi pada then we go into sadhana pada then we go to kaivalya pada okay like that so as i said the aim is for you to have an understanding and appreciation of the depth of this magnificent work and to attempt to live the values therein in your day to day lives right of course those of you who want to go into yoga then you have the conceptual framework you have the practical knowledge for you then to practicalize that knowledge in taking up yoga classes or anything like that right you must have an instructor in front of you who can see you and correct you and tell you what is it you are doing right and what is it you are not doing right that is very important in yoga right can you go to a classroom without teacher right and those of you who have uh, i mean di- differences in opinions may vary here you know those of you who've done you know things over zoom during the pandemic or things over teams or any other kind of you know medium platform you will know it is not the same as face to face especially when it comes to spiritual sadhanas right you have to have a guru who's in front of you the acharya can tell you i can't hear your breathing your breathing is not right your posture is not right your positioning is not right can't do that over can't do that over the internet i know there's so many classes going on online and all of that i'm not saying no to it i'm just looking at the practical side of the instruction value the instruction value right that's all so be be mindful of that so the first verse that starts or commences the entire journey <clears throat> verse 1 is called atha yoga anusasanam 
Atha means now. Yoga, of course, yoga and its practice, you know, the relationship between mind, body, and how those two can relate to the soul. Anusasanam means, Anusasanam means, I'm going to give you explanation. So basically, the word translated means, Atha Yoga Anasasanam means, now I give the explanation of yoga and its related practice. You see, what Patanjali has done with this yoga, <coughs> yoga sutras is, before he created this yoga sutras, there was no such evidence or knowledge or body of knowledge existing in the way in which it has been crafted by Patanjali himself, right? Of course, there were people who were, you know, teaching and they were monopolizing yoga in different ways. There was no uh, consensus on a right approach or a consistent approach, or for that matter, a syllabus that gives you certain aims and objectives or goals, right? So when Patanjali created this, he actually had broke the exploitation or the monopolies of all those teachers who were, you know, so-called yoga masters and who taught it to their students little by little over the years. And of course, with the Yoga Sutras in position, now everybody has to follow that in terms of how to teach yoga and what to teach in yoga. Right? Because everybody can get different experience out of it. Right? For example, if you take a car that is manufactured in Japan, right, and a car that is manufactured in Germany, let's say uh, a, a gasoline combustion engine, right? So what will happen is they both will be similar. Place of manufacturer, color, model may be different, you know, in Japan and in Germany, but they will be essentially similar. So likewise, yoga practice is also the same, right? Everywhere, it will be the same because the human body is the same. Whichever country you are, wherever you are placed, whatever religion you belong to, whatever language you speak, whatever food you eat, your body is the same and it works on the same physics and chemistry and biology principles, right? So what is needed to change the subtle form that produce the gross form is also the same. And what is needed to reverse that from gross to subtle is what we are looking for in yoga. So he is saying, Atha Yoga Anusasana means, and now I'm going to tell you all about yoga. So that's how it starts, verse one. Then verse two, he goes on to say, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodaha. Yoga means the skill, yoga. Hmm? Yoga and yoga. Right, slight difference there. The skill of yoga, yoga, chitta, you know, chitta. Chitta means thoughts, but in this context, it means a mental and emotional energy, which is mixed, right? I mean, where do you get thoughts? I'll come back to it, right? So chitta means a mental and emotional energy when they coincide. Vritti means vibrating. Vritti. Niroda means where it ceases there is a clear restraint or it is not in operation anymore, right? Very clear. The skill of yoga is demonstrated by the conscious non-operation of the vibrational modes of the mental and emotional energy. That's what it means. Yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodha. Right. So let me give you some explanation about this. You see, Everybody, when you want to do something, you don't want to do it alone. You want company. You want two, three people, people you know, people you're comfortable with to go and take a class. Well, yoga is very personal and very practical. It is not a group effort. And the group effect doesn't do something for a personal effect. Every student has to achieve, you know, the different states all by himself or herself. Last week, I told you, in Sadhana Pada is where the Ashtanga Yoga takes place, you know. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and then only Samadhi. You have to go through that. Just because you go with 10 of your best friends doesn't mean you're going to get it sooner rather than later. Or whether, in fact, you're going to get it before another, you know, karmic birth sets in. So, this verse basically means whatever you want to get out of yoga 
you must stop operating from the outside and you must start vibrating from the inside. Yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodha, right? Basically, two aspects here. I said to you, mental and emotional, right? Mental is thinking, emotional is feeling. Whatever energy which you use for thinking is chitta, right? Whatever is used for feeling is also a different type of chitta. As you feel, your mind decides on what you are feeling and it produces the, the, the kind of response to that feeling. I'll give you an example. If you are feeling happy, mentally it will say smile or laugh or be pleasant, isn't it? At the same time, if you're feeling sad, mentally it won't tell you the same thing. It will say, you know, keep a glum face, keep a gloomy face, you know, don't smile, you know, keep your face, you know, restrained, all that kind of thing. So yoga chitta means that, you know, that thought process that bounces from one to the other, one to the other, one, that must stop vibrating, nirodaha. Mm -hmm. Then only you can start the yogic practice. Uh, doesn't mean you can do Patmasana easily. It doesn't mean your mind is <laughs> in control, isn't it? Conscious non-operation of the vibrations between mind and thought. Stop. Then you go into yoga. And the vastness of the emptiness, listen to me, the vastness of the emptiness is where you can experience and inject that stillness into your mind fantastic potential but that vastness you will not experience until you hear all this thing until you stop hearing nirodaha it must cease what must cease the external noise must cease so that the internal silence can be heard so before we started i say stop all noises outside go within where you hear nothing except your own breathing it is in your breathing uh, see, later i will say it is in your breathing that you actually manipulate situation right so that is verse two <clears throat> now question for you right is it completely to completely possible to quieten the mental emotional feeling force because some people say but that's scientifically not possible yes but are we talking about science or are we talking about spirituality right because when you quieten your mind in the overarching dimension of thoughtlessness, everything else becomes controlled or restrained. When you control one part and not control the other part, there is a possibility that this other part may overwhelm the part that is controlled and disturb that control so that it becomes uncontrolled. Then you're back to normal. I mean, that can happen to many people when you start meditation for example right dhyana yoga you find it difficult to move away from thoughts isn't it what is happening at home what is happening in the office what is happening to my daughter my son my wife my husband all those kind of things will come you know you're sitting in the balance at 11 30 in the morning and you're thinking oh my god 11 30 you're ready now I have to go to the market buy the stuff go back cook you know 2 2 30 in the morning. all those things are happening so there is no detachment between the feelings and the mental state of being where you are placed. That's the problem here, right? So verse two talks about that, okay? Then we go on to verse three. Tatha drashtho swarupe avasthanam. Tatha drashtho swarupe avasthanam. Tatha means then, you see it is continuous. Huh? First verse one, will lead you to verse 2. I mean, it's fantastic when you read. It's like one continuous story. The verse 1 leads to verse 2, verse 2 leads to verse 3, verse 3 leads to verse 4. Like this, Patanjali has crafted 196 connecting pearls of wisdom. Pearls of wisdom. Right? You know how difficult it is to go and get a pearl from down deep in the sea, right? He has given us a mala, a necklace, a garland of Yoga Sutra. Pearl by pearl is connected. So verse 3 is Tadadrastu Swarupe Avasthanam. Tada means then. Then means what? Then from the second verse, right? If you can restrain and control your feeling and your mental being, right? Then Drastu, 
the perceiver, the seer, the aspirant. Swarupe, avasthanam. And swarupe means in your own form, in whoever you are, whatever you are at that time. Avasthana means you become grounded there. So meaning of that, tadadrastu swarupe avasthana means then the perceiver is situated in his own form. Verse 3 is already telling you how to still yourself. Hmm? See, when the mental and emotional energy has reached the state of acquiescence, you know, the perceiver within that energy, that's you, experiences himself by himself on his own, alone, in solitude, without the external influence, influences. This is the state of Swarupa. Swarupa means my own form. And now, the body is out and the mind is beginning to latch onto its inner self. But this is, so long as that mental emotional energy vibrates actively, the perceiver is not allowed to re reflect on himself. Because he is instead drawn into the concerns other than his own physical self, into the higher self. So he is now creating that I higher self identity. You understand? So he is detached from who he is or what he is, or whose brother, whose son, whose father, whose husband, all that. You know? So Patanjali was talking about this Swarupe to give encouragement. Basically, he's talking about self realization. Right. After all, if one does not realize that one's essential self is one's inside self, one must identify. If you don't identify with the true self, then you are identifying with yourself with all other types of self, isn't it? Yes or no? <laughs> That's what he's saying. Swarupe. Don't forget your Swarupa, you know, your own original genuine self. Instead, why are you focusing on all kinds of objects and energies, which is not you? So cut all the energies off and then focus on you. Just like a plot, about one petal, two petal, three petal. You'll be just blossoming like a petal. That's verse three. Verse four. Vritti swarupyam itaratraha. Vritti swarupyam itaratraha. That means vritti means that mental emotional energy right mind and feeling okay mind here feeling body right Man, that vritti that mental emotional energy sarupyam with the same format or with the same element of conformity right itaratraha means at other times so what does that mean vritti vritti sarupyam itaratraha means at other times there is conformity with that mental, emotional energy. But when you are sitting in meditation, there must be a cutoff from that. Then only the mind can get the out-of-body experience. Otherwise, if the mind is not detached from the bodily presence and everything that is attached to that bodily presence, then how can you experience something else? You will only experience within that limitation of the body's relatives. My thinking, my eating, my being, my, my experiences, my habits, all of that you will experience, even though you're sitting in, you know, yoga pose. So this is what he's saying. The perceiver, even though he is, uh, I use the word perceiver, aspirant, you know, yogin. Yogin means one who's practicing yoga. Okay. But I don't want to use that word because I don't see uh, everybody as a yogin, right? Yoga masters, perhaps, but we are just aspirants or the one who's trying to see. So he's called the perceiver. Of course, if 10 people look at one thing, they may not all perceive the same thing, isn't it? So perceptions and perceptives can be different, even though you're put in the same situation. Exactly what he's talking about. At other times, there is conformity with that relationship between mind and body, mental emotion. But during yoga, there should be none. That's what you're saying, right? The Sifa must identify himself with his true self. You know? Like uh, Ramana Maharishi said, who am I? What is this body? Who is the real me? You know? And that's how he began to become enlightened. So you must question yourself. 
It is only when these type of bodily connecting thoughts that disturb the mental restraint, we have to overcome them. We have to suppress them and we have to surpass them. Only then that kosha can be removed. So even when I did pancha koshas, I was telling you, the first one is what? Annamaya kosha, right? So if you cannot control your food, don't go to the next. Anon maya kosha, prana maya kosha, vinyana maya kosha, and then only ananda maya kosha. So in many ways, they tell you the same thing. You think yoga science is different? Okay, go through the pancha koshas. You think pancha koshas is different? Go to the, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, yantras or mantras or tantras. If you think that is different, go through the chakras. I mean, nothing is as easy as it sounds. Let's be realistic about it, right? If you want something, you have to be committed to your cause. Hence, in yoga, it is very, very important that the mind element is brought to a level where it is subservient to what you instruct it to be. Otherwise, it's difficult. You want to do one thing, the mind is telling you another thing. Right? I mean, just imagine if animals who cannot communicate with you on a language or linguistic basis can be controlled, can be trained to perform tricks, even a monkey can be controlled and can be taught to perform tricks, then this monkey mind shouldn't be a problem. <coughs> Isn't it? So, verse 4 is telling, other times you may be in conformity with your state of mental, physical self, you know, your feelings and your emotions. But when you sit down to do yoga or meditation, right? So, yoga here is not doing the, you know, practical side of yoga. Yoga means... The four types of yogas, isn't it? I said to you, what Krishna said to Arjuna, right? Bhakti yoga, karma yoga, jnana yoga, and jnana yoga, right? Whichever yoga you want to do, this is the rules, right? So yoga sutras means whatever part of yoga you choose, there are certain injunctions, there are certain requirements, there are certain criteria, there are certain expectations. If you cannot meet them at a very mis minimal or basic level, then it's very difficult for you. That it. Right? That's verse 4. Let's move on to verse 5. Verse 5 is Vrithaya Panchataya Klishta Aklishtaha. Vrithaya Panchataya Klishta Aklishtaha. Vrithaya means the vibrations. Just now I said Vrith, you know, vibrations. The vibrations, Vrithaya means vibrations in between the mental and emotional energy. Panchatavya means fivefold. Panchatavya means fivefold. Klishta aklishta, like bhaya abhaya, bhava abhava, like that. Klishta aklishta. Klishta means agonizing. Klishta means problematic. Krista means, klishta means filled with issues. And aklishta is where there, there's no trouble. In other words, right? Klishta and Aklishta. Basically, this verse means the vibrations in between the mind and the body, that mental uh, mind and the body feeling is fivefold. That energy is fivefold. And that energy, very important, can either be agonizing or non agonizing. I mean, troublesome or non troublesome. Okay. So Patanjali here tells you, even when you go to that level where you want to quieten everything, it can affect you in five different ways. Now, let us look at what the five different ways are, right? And that he talks about in six. You see, he's, I don't know, I mean, that kind of, you know, pristine and science that is, you know, scalpel crafted. You know what is scalpel crafted? That means he has taken everything and given it in such simple terms where there is no chance of escaping what it means. He could have easily said what does five are in the fifth verse itself, but he says, no, there is five things that you must know that relates and controls the vibrations between the mental and emotional energy. So we already know there's five things. And in the sixth one, he talks about what they are. Right? So he says, Pramana Viparjaya Vikalpa Nidra Smrithayaha Pramana Viparjaya 
ವಿಕಲ್ಪ ನಿದ್ರ ಸ್ಮೃತಯ ಪ್ರಮಾಣ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಕೊರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಪರ್ಸೆಪ್ಷನ್ ಪ್ರಮಾಣ ವಿಪರ್ಜಾಯ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಕೊರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಪರ್ಸೆಪ್ಷನ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ಫೈವ್ ವಿಕಲ್ಪ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ವಿಕಲ್ಪ ಇಮ್ಯಾಜಿನೇಷನ್ ವಾಟ್ ಯು ಥಿಂಕ್ ನಿದ್ರ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಯು ನೋ ಸ್ಲೀಪ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸ್ಮೃತಯ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಮೃತ ಸ್ಮೃತಿ ಸ್ಮೃತಯ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಮೆಮರಿ So here, the meaning of pramana vipadhyaya vikalpaha nidra svrittayah means the five values that affect your thinking capacity at the mental emotional level is correct perception, number one, incorrect perception, number two, imagination, number three, sleep, number four, and memory, number five. He's giving you that five-fold. Panchataya. Hmm? Now, let's look at each one of these. What is correct perception? correct perception now this comes as as a value element you know one of the five five fold human values is dharma right right attitude right attitude means having the correct perception basically right this is very important for you to have the right or the correct perception right because right for some people can be right for some people can be wrong right positive for some people can be positive for some people can be negative but what is correct will always be correct what is truth will always be truth right so you must have the perception that what you are trying to do is to move away from your external self and to move in to your internal self and that's why you are doing what you are doing isn't it yes or no so the first thing you have to have is a correct perception is sometimes you know that is why they do the sankalpa sankalpa means the right undertaking that means you are stating the aim or the object of what you are going to do so to have that sankalpa in mind when you sit down or when you want to do any type of yoga you see the second one is incorrect perception because they say not everything you see means what you perceive it to be isn't it you yes know if i show you a glass of water that is half filled some of you may say the glass is half empty some of you may say the glass is half full but the truth is right there is water in the glass right and it can quench some thirst so if you start thinking you know correct perception then you will slowly move away from incorrect perceptions you know it is not the incorrect perceptions that is the problem it is the energy and the vibrations from this incorrect perceptions which cause wrong views the wrong views cause wrong cause wrong waves and therein lies the problem because you are trying to vibrate at a certain level and this incorrect perceptions is rocking the boat as it were right metaphorically speaking okay so correct perception first when you start having correct perception each time every time all the time it will slowly delineate all the incorrect perceptions right and then of course we have number 3 is imagination then it close your eyes and imagine right those of you whom i have taken a class on meditation you know the first thing i ask you to do is close your eyes and i will say to you imagine a light at the center of your forehead right where your you know agnya chakra is located so you imagine so you close your eyes you can imagine your face and you can imagine a light at the same so imagination is the key to successful dharana remember the eight stages ashtanga yeah here we talking about dharana and last week i also explained to you what are the five stages and then the last three stages is what you know um the uh, kaivalya pada looks at sadhana pada talks about all the eight kaivalya talks about dharana dhyana and samadhi so imagination is a powerful tool that you can use to move from the dharana stage to the dhyana stage right dharana is the sixth stage of yoga that means where you're trying to tap the higher attention of the concentration force process of willful right non cooperation of the mental emotional energy is what you're looking for we don't want to have anything to do with what the body feels and what the body tells the mind 
to decide that feeling. We want to completely cut away from it. Right? That is dharana. Focusing, concentrating, so that we can go into the meditative stage. Right? So you cannot just sit, you know, most of the time this happens, you know, people just sit, okay, now we are going to do 10 minutes of dhyana. Very difficult if you haven't got the first six, seven stages. Right? If you haven't got yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, then only dharana, then dhyana. So you cannot just go into dhyana and expect miracles. It's not going to happen. It's clearly said in the Yoga Sutras, right? It's not going to happen. So the first thing you must do is yama. Moral observances, moral values. I gave you what the five moral values are last week, right? Asatya, steya, like that. I said all the five. Then yama to niyama. Spiritual practice. Then, asana, poses. Then only poses come. So straight away you're learning yoga without, you know, mastering yama and niyama is also not going to be fruitful. Right? This is what Krishna told Arjuna. He says, all those living embodies, you know, all those living bodies are entities. This technique is very difficult to achieve, but not impossible. Krishna is telling Arjuna, this technique perhaps is difficult, but not impossible. You know, where he says the mental exertion of those whose minds are attached to invisible existence is greater. So the goal of reaching that invisible reality is attained with difficulty for human beings. Look at chapter 12. Nasi is Klesho de Katharas, Tesam, Avyakta Shakta Chetasam, Avyakta Higatit Yaknum, Deha Vadit Avabyate. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. Right? So that is the third thing imagination. What's the fourth thing? Sleep. Right? So sometimes you feel really relaxed when you go into it because this is one of the effects of going into meditation. You go into deep sleep, you know, and then uh, you you curtail everything else that can come because you're you're already in that sleep mode. In the sleep mode means nothing else will happen. Perhaps you know you, you you feel good when you finish it, but it's a very basic stage of being. Perhaps a good stage because from there you can catapult to a higher level. So sleep is a is also another level of vibration once you start engaging in yoga. So you can completely feel relaxed. That's very good if you want to relax yourself, right? Also good. But then you're still connected to the gross body. You're not connected to the subtle body. Subtle is where you're completely detached. Here you're still in that human requirement of sleep mode. So some amount of detachment, but not a lot. Okay. And finally, memory. The vibration of memory is ever active. And the function is to automatically prompt you. And you will get something from either the mental or the emotional chambers of memory. Isn't it? If I, for example, I ask you a question. Okay, brother or sister, can you tell me in the last one week or one month something that made you very happy? So your answer will either come from the physical plane of memory or from the mental plane of memory. It's like, oh, you know, I went swimming. I had one of the best times. So you actually, in your mind, you're picturing that, that place where you went swimming or you went on a holiday or something and you swam and you had such a nice, beautiful time and you tell me about it. But it's coming from the mental emotional energy where the chambers of memory are keeping this. What is memory? Memory is something that you've already experienced. That is all. You cannot have a memory where you haven't experienced it. Good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, it is your experience. And that is what memory is all about. So, what uh, Patanjali is saying is, you, you know, when you start this yogic practice, it can curtail you in five ways. Correct perception, if you don't have it, that means you're having incorrect perception, that will curtail then, of course, imagination can curtail it. 
sleep can curtail it and of course memory can curtail it. So he's giving you answers of how to transgress and transcend these different five types so that you can go into that level. What is that level? He talks about this in verse 7. He says, Pratyaksha Anumana Agamana Pramanani. Pratyaksha Anumana Agama Pramanani. Pratyaksha means direct but correct perception. Anumana, or sometimes it's referred to Anumanya. Correct analysis. Right? Agama means correct reference. And of course, Pramanani means true perception, correct perception. So Pratyaksha Anumana Agama Pramanani means correct perception may be acquired directly by correct analysis or by correct reference. So if you apply this to life, you know, I've spoken about this previously, it is the three Vs, V1, V2, and V3. This is Pratyaksha, Anumanaha, Agama, Pramanani. This is verse 7. It's exactly talking about the three Vs. What are the three Vs? The three Vs are, you know, which you should practicalize in your life, right? Vichara, Vichara, Viveka, and Vak. Three Vs. Vichara, Viveka, and Vak. So what is that? How does that relate to our practical life? Well, it's very simple. Whenever you hear something, Right? Because we're talking about correct perception and correct analysis, isn't it? Right. Okay. So, vichara means whenever, let's say, somebody comes and says, Hey, did you hear about Raj? So, correct perception, correct analysis. First, you must do vichara, the first V. Vichara means what? Investigate, confirm whether it's true and all of that or not. Okay. Is the information correct? Is the information correct? Firstly, you don't have to do it if the information is useless to you. Right? Only information is only use, useful if it can develop you, if it can make you progressive, right? If it can make you become a bit more evolved, then that information is useful to you. Otherwise, just throw it, discard it, it's useless. What's the point of finding out whether what Raja said to Rani is true or false? Isn't it? So again, exercising the right discrimination, the second, is Viveka. Once you have confirmed the correctness of the information, then you exercise the second V, which is Viveka, by saying, okay, do I need this? What use is this information to me? You know, you exercise your sense of discrimination, Viveka. Viveka means discrimination, right? Then only you go to the third one, which is Vak, speech. Okay, thank you for telling me, brother, but it really makes no difference to me or my life. So, you know, please, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get involved in all this. Let me continue. Finish. Walk. Instead, what the normal common human being does is, oh, really? Raja said that? Oh, my God. Then you call your friends and you pass that news. And half a day is gone just forwarding messages. Isn't that life? Isn't that the life that you are involved with right now? So, in verse 7, he's already said, if you don't have correct perception by exercising Viveka correctly and then speaking correctly by correct analysis and correct reference, you ain't moving. You ain't moving forward, right? Very, very elementary, but very, very significant. Poignant to the point of moving from one stage of ignorance, you know, and pulling yourself to the next stage, which is knowledge. In a room full of darkness, and I've always said this, in a room full of darkness, you only need to light one candle. And in the entire room of darkness, you should be able to see that light. Right? Once Ramana Maharishi had some students with him, and he asked for a white board. Okay? Because he wanted to teach the students something. Right? So they brought the whiteboard in. And uh, he said, give me a charcoal. You know, a piece of charcoal. So they brought a charcoal. And he went. And right in the middle of, you know, the board, he drew a circle. And he colored that circle. Like with the charcoal. 
Then he said, look at the board. All of you, look at the board. And he said, what do you see? What can you see? And everybody said, oh, we saw the black dot that you drew. Black dot, black dot, black dot. Unanimously, the answer was black dot. Raman Maheshi said, amidst the entire white board, there's so much of whiteness, but you fellows can only see that little black dot, which I drew in the middle. This is the extent of your awareness or the, pro uh, or the positioning of your chitta, your thoughts. You're always homing in on the wrong thing and making that thing govern your thought process and the mental emotional energy between the mind and the body feeling. Oh, fantastically, he's thought that. Right? That is verse seven. Very simple. Pratyaksha Anumanaha Agama Pramanani. Correct perception only begotten by correct analysis, correct reference. What a lovely lesson in life he has given through verse seven. Isn't it? If, for example, right, if you, for example, have one of those telescopes, you know, some people have, right? Um, I know one of my good friends here, his daughter has a, something like a telescope, like a Hubble telescope, not Hubble, but, you know, something like that, which she keeps in her room and she can see. But the point is, even if you have the best equipment, sometimes you can't see if there are clouds, isn't it? If there's a cloudy night. No matter how good the instrument, you cannot go beyond those cloud formations. This is exactly what he's saying. Not only must you have an accurate instrument, you must put yourself in a proper position, physically and mentally. Then only the reality perceiving intellect will start to work for you. You have to develop that. Right? So these are all lessons that he is saying in different ways of how you can develop yourself to become a yogin. Okay. Verse 8. Vipargyaya mitya jnanam atadrupa pratishtham. Vipargyaya mitya jnanam adrupa pratishtham. Vipargyaya means incorrect perception. Mitya. Is the opposite of satya. Satya is truth means mitya must be false. Jnana means intelligence based on information. Athat means not this. Rupa means form, not of this form. Pratishta means is based on where it's positioned. Okay, so each word, but if you string it into a sentence, incorrect perception. You see, verse 7 talked about correct perception. Such clarity is giving. Verse 8, he's talking about incorrect, incorrect perception is based on false information and on perception of what is not true form. What is not true form. Like I've always said, you have an idol of Ganesha that you worship, 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 worship. But it should move you from the level of idol worship, right? To go beyond that signs of forms. Otherwise, your worship becomes idol, I-D-L-E. I-D-O-L, if you don't progress beyond, becomes I-D-L-E. Idol, 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 that's it. Don't worry, next birth you'll have chance to further progress it. For some time, focus on that form, then go into the formless. Because only when you have the formless can you go into space. It has got no limitations. You cannot go and look for the form of Ganesha in space. It is non-existent, I can tell you now. Right? Sat guna and nit guna. From sat, you must move to nit. Sat guna, that with form. Nit guna, that is without form. That is without form, is real. That with form should get you from the unreal to the real. Don't you say this prayer? Right? When I did uh, Upanishads with you, I said to you, Asat Thoma Sat Gamaya. Yoga tells you this. Science of Dhyana tells you this. Science of Raja Yoga, Jnana Yoga tells you this. Science of Karma Yoga tells you this. Then where is the problem? So incorrect perception is based on false information. Like I said to you, correct perception is Vichara, Viveka and Vak. Once you practice that, you will never have incorrect perception. Right? 
If somebody buys a new car in their house somewhere, how does it affect you or your life? Or they buy a new house, or the, 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 one of the child marries a very rich uh, you know, boy, or one of the girl marries a very rich boy. How does it affect you? Feel happy, bless them. Because what you bless comes back to you. Not uh, speak bad and say, oh my God, that girl, my God, if only you knew what she was doing in her university days, oh my God. That's incorrect perception. Clearly, Patanjali is saying, if this is the way you are living your life, then forget about transcending that mental, emotional energy because you are caught in it. No way you can move beyond. Verse 9. Sabda anupati vastu sunya vikalpaha. Sabda anupati vastu sunya vikalpaha. Sabda jnana means written or spoken information. Sabda jnana means written or spoken information. Anupati means those who are following it. Vastu sunya means it, it's not real. It's devoid of reality, if you like. Right? Without, without anything real attached to it. And vikalpa means, like what I said to you earlier, imagination. Right? So if you string it into a sentence, it means verbal or written information, which is followed by concepts which do not relate to any sense of reality is imagination. Verbal or written information, which is followed by concepts, which are devoid or not related to reality is imagination. Right? For example, uh, someone who's ill, can you imagine they're having the holiday of their time in some beach or some park or some mountain or somewhere? So although they are imagining it, whether it is written or whether it's verbal or whether it's mind-based, it's devoid of reality, isn't it? Reality is when you open your eyes, yeah, you're in the hospital in a bed, right? So this is why he's saying, Sabda jnana anupati vastu sunya vikalpaha, verbal or written information, which people follow, which has a concept of unrealistic practicality is basic imagination. You know. So whatever is written, whatever is verbally said to you, whatever picturization is offered to you, remember, either you have a correct perception or you have an incorrect perception. Correct perception will lead to some results. Incorrect perception will lead to some other results. So choice is yours. Right? Moving on to verse 10. Abhaya, Pratyaya, Alambhana vritti nidraha. Right? Abhava, like bhava, abhava. Pratyaya. Alambhana vritti nidraha. Abhaya means an absence of awareness. Bhava. Abhava means absence of awareness. Pratyaya means your sense of conviction, you know, or your belief, solid belief. Alambhana means uh, something that can support you or uh, something that can allow you to do something else. So it's a means of conversion, if you like. And vrit, I said vrit means vibration. Nidra means sleep. That's what each of these words means. But if you string it together to make it, you know, to make it sound contextually sensible, then sleep, nidra, is the vibrational mode which is supported by the absence of objective awareness. See, when you read it in Sanskrit, to translate, you must go the other way around, back to front. Right? Abhaya pratyaya alambhana vritti nidraha. That basically means sleep, nidra, then vritti, then alambhana, then pratyaya, then abhava. Right? Sleep is the vibrational mode which is supported by the absence of objective awareness, isn't it? See, if the mind is not stilled when you go to sleep, it depends on what the thoughts, what the chitta was before you went to sleep and the state of mind, you know, if you're tensed, if you're um, feeling, you know, uh, agonized, if you are um, tensed, stressed, sad, that can lead to different experiences of the sleep you have. You know, sometimes you sleep and you get up in the morning and say, well, I had a bad sleep and I couldn't sleep at all. I was tossing and turning. All that is because the mind is not rested. 
right? The absence of objective awareness. So it's very easy, right? You see your hand here, right? Left hand and right hand, you've got to do on both. You see there's a line at the bottom, isn't it? Right? So if you put three fingers right at the bottom, where the line is, where the line is, and then this part is where you can feel in between the two bones, there is one space, right? So bottom line there, you put these three fingers and then this finger can identify the spot, right? All you have to do is use your middle finger, your index finger and press. Like one minute you press, like every second you press it, right? Press like what I'm doing now. And that gives you, uh, makes your mind feel relaxed. We'll do it in both hands, right? One minute here, one minute here, one minute here, one minute here. Do it for three minutes or four, six minutes, three minutes on the right hand, three minutes on the left hand, alternatively. You will feel relaxed. And you'll go to sleep. Otherwise, you will have dreams. And dreams is basically nothing but state of mind. Right. It depends on what level of consciousness you are as well. The different dreams can have different connotations. Right? It means I have people calling me and saying, brother, last night I dreamt of pythons. So for me, that is energy. Right? So I ask, was it upright like this or was it coiled? Was it asleep? Was it moving away? Was it coming to you? You know, I ask all those questions to get a sense of the level of consciousness that placed him in that dream so that the factors that happen in the dream can be connected to some, you know, what we call prakriti. So it is not always as meaning, right? So do that exercise, it just puts you to sleep, right? And I never have problems sleeping. I can sleep anytime, anywhere, right? That is a God's gift, right? It doesn't matter where I can sleep. When at home, one day I sleep on the floor, one day in the week, just on the floor, I can sleep. Or when I do my fasting and all, I only sleep on the floor with nothing, just a dhoti and I sleep on it even without pillow. Now that prepares the body. Should you be put in a similar position anywhere in the world, you can sleep because you've got that experience. What did I say earlier? Experience is a memory, isn't it? Your memory will go, ah, we have slept here, this place before like this. If you only sleep on a bed and you're used to that comfort, that is your experience and that memory will be captured. So if you sleep in a place less comfortable, the body will straight away react. 100%. You know, this is a story. There's a big uh, story, isn't it? The princess and the pea. Remember this story, the princess and the pea? So many mattresses, they put a small pea at the bottom mattress and she didn't have a good sleep because she could feel the discomfort. So whatever you put your body through, a memory is there, right? So, you know, when I do the, the fast, when I've done it in the past, people say, oh, for 16 days during the Pitu Paksha, you only eat curd rice. I said, yeah, because the memory is there. Once I do that, straight away, it was, ah, it's the next 16 days, ready. That's it. Finish. If you haven't had the experience, then you have to go through the trials and tribulations of getting that experience so that the memory can capture that experience. And next time you do it, it becomes easier. That's why they say first time when you do something is always difficult, isn't it? Right? Verse 11. Anubhuta visaya asam pramosha smriti. Anubhuta visaya asam pramosha smriti. Anubhuta means experience. Vishaya means the object. Asam pramosha means retention and smriti means memory. Right? So, convert it around, sentence becomes memory is the retained impression of experienced objects. What I just told you. Right? Anubhuta vishaya, asam pramosha smritihi. Memory is the retained impression of experienced objects. What you have experienced. If you walked barefoot before, walking barefoot will not be a problem because the mind will tell you, hey, you've done this before, do it. First time you're walking without shoes, then that's a problem. Because you've not experienced it. If you haven't experienced it, it's not in your memory. So what is he saying? Whatever good you want to keep in your memory, do it. And the memory is 
capturing all the goodness. Bad also the memory will capture. Right? So sometimes it goes go back on good, sometimes it goes back on bad because that is what you put. You have saved in your USB drive <laughs> up there, good and bad. It's saying, no, you have the control. You can delete. But if you put save as, then the mind will save it as, isn't it? You have the element of neutralizing all the bad effects from your memory. If you choose to put it in there, then of course, memory will be there. <clears throat> Verse 12 says, Abhyayasa, Abhyasa, Vairagya Abhyam, Thannirodaha. Abhyasa, Vairagya Abhyam, Thannirodaha. Basically, Abhyasa means effective practice of yoga. Vairagya Abhyam means non-interest or you don't have a lack of uh, concern, you know, total lack of concern, non-interference, couldn't care less. Tan means that. Oh. And Nirodha means, Nirodha means, I looked at it earlier, cessation, restraint, or non-operation, ceaselessness. Basically, translated, it means that non-operation of vibrational modes is achieved by effective practice. That non-operation of vibrational modes is achieved by effective practice in not having an interest, in not having an interest in the very same operation. Basically, do your duty. Do not expect any results or rewards or recognition. When I did Gita, I said this to you. Even when I did Bhaja Govindam, I said to you, do your duty. Don't worry about what comes. Don't go for reward, recognition or award. The non-operation of the vibrational mode is achieved by effective practice of detachment, basically. Vairagya Bhyam. Right? So the more you practice Vairagya, the more you will get into Abhyasa, effective yogic practice. Two words I'll take from this verse and say Vairagya and Abhyasa. I mean, last week I also told you this. Two things you need. Abhyasa. Follow the yogic practice only by detachment, vairagya. That's what he's saying in verse 12. Abhyasya, right? Abhyasa, vairagya, abhyam, thannirodaha. Right? Because he explains then in verse 13, tatra stithau yatna abhyasaha. Tatra stithau yatna abhyasaha. What's he saying? Tatra means there, in that case. Tithau, regarding the your own sense of commitment, your own sense of steadiness, your own sense of perception, your own sense of accountability, responsibility, all that. To that extent, yatna, endeavor, abhyasa, practice. Right? In that case, practice is the persistent endeavor to cultivate that lack of interest in what is happening externally. Oh, fantastic. I said one just connects to the next, just connects to the next, just connects to the next. Tatra stitho yatna abhyasaha. Right? This practice of continuously latching on to, you know, bodily or body conscious comforts, desires basically. Right? And you must learn to cut off. So the self-conceited mentality, the self-conceited mentality is only used to enjoy privately in the psychology of perverseness or harmfulness. He's saying, you must curb this. There must be an effective curtailment of this mental attitude. Then you're going, you know. Shankara says in, in Bhaja Govinda, only when you get away and you connect to that immutable reality, immutable reality, then only you can experience the divine. And the last verse for today is verse 14. Satu dirgha kalaha nairantharya satkara asevitha draga bhumihi. Right? 
ಸಥು ದೀರ್ಘಕಾಲ ನೈರಂಥವ್ಯ ಸತ್ಕರ ಅಸೇವಿತ ದೃಢಭೂಮಿ ಸಾಥು ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಬಟ್ ದೀರ್ಘ ಕಾಲ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ದೀರ್ಘ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಲಾಂಗ್ ಕಾಲ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಟೈಮ್ ರೈಟ್ ನೈರಂಥರ್ಯ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಇಂಟರಾಪ್ಟೆಡ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಸ್ ನೈರಂಥರ್ಯ ರೈಟ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಸ್ ಸತ್ಕರ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ರೆವರೆನ್ಸ್ or you know care or attention or respect asevita means doing the same thing sustained practice or doing things with an aggressive interest or aggressive you know what you call sankalpa you know want to do this drida firm bhumi means grounded foundation solid right but that is attained on the firm basis of a continuous reverential sustained practice which is executed for a long time how fantastic you see you are here today in 2022 after i don't know how many births hundreds thousands maybe billions so for you in one birth to remove all the psyche that is associated with the past karmas is a bit difficult but this is what patanjali is saying ಸಾಧು ದೀರ್ಘಕಾಲ ನೈರಂತರ್ಯ ಸತ್ಕರ ಅಸೇವಿತ ದೃಢಭೂಮಿ ದಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಟೇನ್ಡ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಫರ್ಮ್ ಬೇಸಿಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಸ್ ರೆವರೆನ್ಶಿಯಲ್ ಸಸ್ಟೇನ್ಡ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಅ ಲಾಂಗ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ರಿವರ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ಯು ನಾಟ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಅ ವೀಕ್ ಯು ನೋ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಟೂ ವೀಕ್ಸ್ continuous sustained practice over a long period of time on the firm basis that every time i'm doing i'm chiseling one part of my karmic boulder until the last chip is chiseled away then you are free <clears throat> so that has brought us to the first 14 sutras in the 196 right so next week we look at verse number 15 to verse number 28 uh, i will again explain what it means anyada sharanam nasti tumeva sharanam mama asmat karunya bhavena raksha raksha yogi ishvara ayom tatsat sairam <laughs>